everyone. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Um, really appreciative of those who are showing up. Um, Stephen, I'd like to see you. Uh, Robert, I don't think we've met before, um, but I, I'm very pleased that you're here. Uh, you're on mute, Robert. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to be here. Um, I'll, I'll leave the, the proper formal introductions to Stephen. Um, I'm, I'm mostly here uh, just to say welcome and hello uh, before things get started. I'm glad to see this seminar kicking off. Uh, quite a few philosophers associated with Wolf. I know GCAS has got a, a couple of programs, uh, the MA in philosophy and a new PhD program that's coming out. Um, I'm glad to see the, the public um, seminar series happening as well. Um, I can say a few words about Wolf. I, I think that's uh, my role here. And so at a high level, um, Wolf is a, a young collegiate uh, university um, and is, I think, the first global collegiate university to allow qualified education organizations to join as member colleges. And then they go through kind of an internal accreditation and an onboarding process after which they're able to offer accredited degrees. Um, currently, those degrees are issued out of the European Union in the ECTS system and then are deemed to be US regional accreditation equivalent in the United States. Um, this is a, a public seminar series. And, and so uh, there are other public seminar series that, that others who, who want to organize um, can be created in more or less any field. Um, but this one's on post-Kantian philosophy, um, which I'm, I'm pleased to see, given that for at least a brief period of time, I was a post-Kantian philosopher uh, at Oxford and on the faculty of philosophy there, uh, as well as the, the congregation. Um, I, I don't have anything more um, sort of serious to say than those things, except that I'm delighted to see this uh, going forward. And the, the speaker lineup is impressive indeed. Um, the topic list uh, also looks very interesting. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'll pass it off to Stephen DeLay. I won't be able to stay for the whole thing, although I'll loop back and forth as I'm, I'm jumping from some other meetings. Great. Many thanks, Joshua, for, for being here. And thanks to everybody who's here as well. I see a number of uh, familiar names and faces. So it's really kind of you all to take the time to be here. Uh, as Joshua mentioned, today is the first of our Wolf Post-Kantian Philosophy Seminars. Uh, the plan is to meet monthly, uh, the last week of the month, typically on a Wednesday, though you'll want to check the schedule for details. Um, today, it's my pleasure to say that our first speaker is Professor Robert Stern uh, from the Department of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield. Uh, Professor Stern is a fellow of the British Academy, uh, former editor-in-chief of European Journal of Philosophy, and he's joining us today from New Haven. Uh, I understand he's a visiting professor at Yale for the year. Uh, you may know Professor Stern's work in uh, philosophy, uh, history of philosophy, uh, particularly Kant and a number of post-Kantian figures uh, such as uh, Hegel. Uh, his most recent book was 2019 with OUP, uh, The Radical Demand in Lukestrup's Ethics. It's a fantastic book. I recommend reading it. And I mention it because if you've read that book, you'll know that in the course of discussing Lukestrup, it's Kierkegaard who comes up for discussion uh, often. And so today, Professor Stern is going to kind of continue that conversation about this interesting interface between Lukestrup and Kierkegaard with a paper entitled Lukestrup's Radical Demand Between Kierkegaard and Life in the Crowd. So, uh, Bob, uh, over to you. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for having me. Uh, thanks for coming again. Yeah, I recognize some familiar faces, so it's nice to see you across the airwaves, as it were. Um, OK, so I've got a PowerPoint, so I'll sort of share my screen. I think that may mean I can't see you so well, but, uh, you know, hopefully um, you know, just shout if there's some problem. Um, but I'll, I'll share the screen now. Um, good. Um, so the plan, yeah, I'll talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes, and then obviously we can have some discussion. Um, let me just. Right. So, yeah, the, the title is Looks for its Radical Demand Between Kierkegaard and Life in the Crowd. Um, and, whoops, sorry, just one sec. Yeah. And so, what I'm going to be doing is discussing the ethics of the Danish philosopher and theologian 
K. Lugstrup. Um, some of you I know <laughs> uh, know a lot about Lugstrup, some perhaps not so much. So I'll, I'll, I'll be um, introducing some of his key ideas as well. Um, but I'm going to suggest that um, Lugstrup's ethics, one way of seeing his ethics is as providing an interesting response to Kierkegaard's concerns about life in the crowd, but in a way that avoids Lugstrup's own, uh, sorry, avoids Kierkegaard's own response to that issue um, because Lugstrup rejects Kierkegaard's way of handling it. Now, uh, as we'll see, it's a kind of contested issue whether Lugstrup's criticisms of Kierkegaard's uh, position are justified. That's a topic in its own right, and I'm going to sort of try and avoid it, as you'll see, <laughs> um, because I'm more interested in a different question, which is um, if Lugstrup's own positive position actually solves Kierkegaard's problem, whether or not uh, Lugstrup's right to reject Kierkegaard's own solution. Um, so what I'll, the structure of the talk would just be to say something about Lugstrup, as I say, introduce him to those of you who perhaps haven't come across Lugstrup's work before, and then say something in a general way about his relation to Kierkegaard. I'm then going to present Kierkegaard's problem, the issue that Kierkegaard raises about life in the crowd. Um, and then I'm going to briefly say why Lugstrup was dissatisfied with Kierkegaard's own response to the problem as Lugstrup understood it. But as I say, I'm not going to get <laughs> bogged down in whether Lugstrup's right to be critical of Kierkegaard. I'm going to move on more to uh, the positive view of discussing how Lugstrup himself tries to solve Kierkegaard's problem. And then I'll assess the response. So uh, when Steve kindly asked me to do this talk and told me that the seminar is called Post-Kantian Philosophy. I said, well, is it okay to talk about this topic? Uh, and, uh, you know, he kindly agreed it is. And I think that that's uh, legitimate because, of course, we can think of Kierkegaard as in some sense a post-Kantian philosopher, but also um, we'll see in the final section um, why I think um, Lugstrup might be seen as going beyond Kant in certain respects here. So that the, there is, I think, <laughs> a suitable connection to the themes of this seminar series, I hope. Okay, so just to say something, as I say, about Lugstrup uh, in general, and then his relation to Kierkegaard. So who was Lugstrup? Well, he's a Danish philosopher and theologian, uh, 20th century, you can see his dates there. He's influenced by the phenomenological movement, so Husserl, Husserl Scheler, uh, Hans Lips, and Heidegger, and also by Kierkegaard, and more broadly by Lutheran theology. Um, so his first position was as a Lutheran pastor uh, till 1943, but then from then onwards, he goes to be a professor at University of Aarhus in Denmark, where he stays for the whole of his uh, career. You can see from the dates that that means he lives through the Nazi occupation of Denmark, and that has an impact on his thinking in various ways, I think, that we could discuss later. Um, and then uh, the main work, the work for which he's best known, um, is The Ethical Demand, which appears in 1956. Um, and there's a, an earlier English translation of it by Notre Dame and a more recent one, uh, uh, by myself and Bjorn Radberg, who's here, um, I think, uh, with OUP. There's then subsequent work that covers, again, ethics, but also metaphysics and, and to some extent aesthetics and other areas. Uh, if you're interested in finding a sort of English compendium of that later work, um, there's a collection called Beyond the Ethical Demand um, with Notre Dame in 2007. That's quite a useful text. Um, to, to have if you're interested in the, in the later work. Um, but again, uh, as I'll mention in a second, um, there's also translations going on of this later material too. Um, now, if you then move on to thinking about Lugstrup's relation to Kierkegaard, um, the dominant image of that relation is uh, one of rejection or confrontation. So, the, the main text that I'll be mentioning uh, in the talk and other points um, is from 1968, Obgur med Kierkegaard, uh, 
Um, and that's actually something that, again, OUP have a translation coming out, hopefully <laughs> sometime, what are we, yeah, be next year, um, but it's in, in the works, as it were, being copy edited, etc. cetera. Um, and one issue is how to translate that title. Um, we've gone with Controvert in Kierkegaard just because that is a title that uh, was used in previous English versions of bits of the text. Um, but actually, Obgor is quite a dramatic um, uh, term. It could mean something like showdown <laughs> or sort of battle or, or co confrontation with Kierkegaard. So you can see that um, the way that Lugstrup sets things up is in this rather confrontational, um, polemical form. Um, and part of the reason for that is that Kierkegaard's writing in the context um, of Danish Kierkegaardianism, um, and that was dominated by a group uh, 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 associated with a journal, um, uh, Tidehev, um, where several of these more radical Kierkegaardians um, were focused. And uh, Lugstrup had, a, as were, a love-hate relationship to this group. So he was part of the group, um, but for various reasons, um, fell out with them. Uh, and that means partly, therefore, it sets things up in a rather confrontational form, but it also means that um, Lugstrup's reading of Kierkegaard himself is through these other uh, writers. And they tended, this is in a sort of post-war context, to have rather radical readings of Kierkegaard, maybe more radical than we would um, want to put forward today. So there is a bit of an issue um, about how well uh, Lugstrup um, came to understand Kierkegaard and whether he's really attacking Kierkegaard or some uh, other form of Kierkegaardianism um, in Denmark at the time and so on. So it becomes quite a contested, tricky issue. Um, now, in terms of the relevant works, as well as the couple that I mentioned, the ethical demand and then this controverting Kierkegaard, um, there's also an earlier work from 1950 um, called in English, again, which is translated with OUP, Kierkegaard's and Heidegger's analysis of existence and its relation to proclamation. Whereas you can tell from the title, Lugstrup compares Kierkegaard and Heidegger in various respects. And that is critical, but perhaps slightly less critical because again, slightly earlier on, um, things were, was, were somewhat less polemical. Then you have the ethical demand, and then there's an essay called Ethics and Ontology, which is translated in the appendix to the Notre Dame edition of the ethical demand, which again discusses Kierkegaard. And then we, you've got Obkor made Kierkegaard itself, controversy in Kierkegaard. So those are the sort of main texts, I guess, um, if you're wanting to follow this up at all. And, and I'll be yeah referring to some of these as we go along. Okay, so as I said, uh, Lugstrup on his side ends up rather seeing Kierkegaard as a sort of enemy to be vanquished, and uh, in a way you can hardly blame them, but Kierkegaardians have therefore <laughs> reciprocated by tending to be pretty critical and dismissive of Lugstrup. Um, so there aren't many discussions of Lugstrup in the Kierkegaard literature, but the, the ones that are uh, are pretty hostile, and you know, in a way, you can't blame them, right? <laughs> because Lugstrup seems pretty hostile to their hero, Kika. Um, and uh, uh, that is a debate, you know, that 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 has its kind of interest. But I think, in it, in the end, perhaps it's not a very productive way of discussing their relationship because it it partly it can obscure um, the way in which they have actually rather key common goals, common interests, common uh, ways of thinking. And then if you think of it in that way, you can think of the relationship in a slightly more positive form, perhaps, by assessing them against how well each side uh, deals with the, their shared goals. Of course, they might still disagree, um, but perhaps it will be a more productive uh, disagreement, a more, more dialogical disagreement than just confrontation. Um, so what is the common goal? Well, I think there's perhaps more than one, but the one I want to focus on is this issue of life in the crowd. Um, and uh, Lugstrup thinks that Kierkegaard uh, has that as a problem he's trying to solve, but Lugstrup thinks the alternative Kierkegaard offers is too extreme. And he tends to sort of summarize that view 
Kierkegaard's view is uh, the idea of an infinite demand. Um, and I'll say more about what that means in a second. But Luxret thinks he can uh, incorporate certain key Kierkegaardian themes with a middle position that's more stable, less extreme than Kierkegaard's own view. So uh, there's some position that Lugstrup's trying to occupy between life and the crowd on the one hand, that both he and Kierkegaard want to uh, deal with as a problem, and Kierkegaard's, as, as Lugstrup sees it, extreme solution, which is the infinite demand. Now, then we can ask the question, well, is Lugstrup's alternative more stable than Kierkegaard's? And does it incorporate um, the, the, the moves that Kierkegaard's trying to make uh, in a successful way. And you could ask parallel questions, I think, about Heidegger and his response to the issue of Das Mann. And that's, again, in that 1950 book, um, that's partly how Kierkegaard and uh, how Lugstrup puts Kierkegaard and Heidegger together. So what is the problem of life in the crowd? Um, well, here's a, a pretty well-known passage that sort of summarizes some of the issues from Kierkegaard. There is a view of life which conceives that where the crowd is, there also is truth, and that in truth itself, there is need of having the crowd on its side. There is another view of life which conceives uh, that uh, wherever there is a crowd, there is untruth, so that to consider for a moment the extreme case, even if every individual, each for himself in private, were to be in possession of the truth, yet in, uh, uh, in case they were all to get together in a crowd, untruth would at once be in evidence, for a crowd is the untruth. So various sort of recognizable Kierkegaardian themes going on um, in that passage to do with the notion of truth and objectivity and subjectivity and so on. Um, but as well as that passage and that discussion, I mean, I think you can see this issue, for example, in the in the background of, say, uh, Kierkegaard's critique of Christendom, where um, life in the church has become just a sort of life in the crowd, and also of Hegel. So um, there's a, a well-known passage from the philosophy of right, where Hegel says, uh, when I will what is rational, I act not as a particular individual, but in accordance with the concepts of ethics in general. In an ethical act, I vindicate not myself, but the thing. But a person who does something perverse gives the greatest prominence to his particularity. The rational is the high road which everyone follows and no one stands out from the rest. So um, I think Kierkegaard, uh, reading those sorts of passages in Hegel, um, sees that as representative of ethical life, Sittlichkeit, and then Judge William, say from either or, becomes a sort of representative of that sort of Hegelian view of a kind of life in the crowd as the ethical stage. So, you know, I think um, Lugstrup's right to uh, see this issue as important to Kierkegaard and as a problem that um, he's very interested in. However, um, while Lugstrup follows Kierkegaard in seeing this as a genuine issue, uh, life in the crowd and conformism, he thinks that Kierkegaard's response to the problem doesn't work. And he makes that worry clear from those Berlin lectures from 1950 onwards. Um, given um, that both want to avoid life in the crowd or overcome that problem, does Kierkegaard offer a different conception of how to be an individual outside the crowd? So that's a, a, an important um, uh, yeah, no, that's right. Given that they both want to avoid life in the crowd, looks at its question really is, does Kierkegaard offer a solution to it? Does he um, provide a way of escaping from life in the crowd? And Lugstrup thinks Kierkegaard's alternative fails. He can't really solve the problem. Um, and um, uh, therefore Lugstrup thinks he has to solve it in a different way. Now, why does uh, Lugstrup think that Kierkegaard's alternative doesn't work? And I'm just going to briefly outline that, but I'm, as I say, I'm not going to assess whether Lugstrup's right. Um, so I think, put briefly, Lugstrup's conception of Kierkegaard's response to the problem might be put as follows. Kierkegaard replaces Hegelian cyclicite with an infinite demand. And that essentially moves us from ethics to 
a religious relation to God, but in a way that proves to be ethically empty. So if you like, you move from ethics to religion. So instead, Logstrip's trying to offer a solution that remains within ethics, uh, but ethics in a suitably radicalized form. And again, I think if one way of thinking about this is to perhaps compare uh, Lugstrup's strategy uh, in relation to Kierkegaard to Levinas's strategy in relation to Heidegger, because Levinas, as, as, as you'll know, probably uh, worries that Heidegger seems or claims in some sense to abandon ethics in order to deal with the problem of Das Mann and so on. Um, but Levinas arguably wants to stay within the ethical, but in a more radicalized form. So there is a kind of parallel there, I think, um, in their strategies. So just to sort of illustrate this from Lugstrup's point of view, one might think of Abraham in fear and trembling. As a knight of faith, Abraham escapes life in the crowd um, uh, in the sense that he's removed from a sort of universal ethics, which can be publicly communicated and justified, and he's sort of isolated by his faith. So he, he can't, for example, talk about what he's doing to Sarah. Um, that seems an important part of the account that uh, Kierkegaard's giving, and therefore you have the teleological suspension of the ethical. Now, again, what exactly that means is very debatable, but I think Lugstrip thinks it means uh, you, you get beyond the ethical in some important sense. But the price from Lugstrip's point of view is that then ethical content is removed, um, and all that you're doing, if you're Abraham, is obeying God, but that obedience is not is in a certain sense contentless. Um, it, it, it's just obedience to whatever it is that God asks you to do. Now, again, <laughs> I know that's not necessarily an acceptable reading of Fear and Trembling, but I'm just presenting Lugstrup's take on it, I think. And now um, works of love, uh, which is something Lugstrup discusses uh, more, um, um, a, 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 again, particularly in controversy in Kierkegaard, um, the question, um, as, as Lugstrup reads it, uh, that uh, Kierkegaard's grappling with is how to understand loving your neighbor that doesn't reduce to Hegelian Sichlichkeit. And he thinks Kierkegaard's answer is that the aim of neighbor love is not related to the finite, but to the infinite. So it's not about, if you like, worldly care, but enabling the neighbor to love God. And again, the result of that, uh, looks at things for Kierkegaard, is to, again, isolate the Christian, the true Christian, um, as this intervention in the life of the other person won't be recognized as love by the neighbor. Um, but that's good in the sense that it, um, again, pushes the individual out of the crowd. So Lugstrup says, any non-conflictual relation with the neighbor is for Kierkegaard conformity. And in the final analysis, only one thing accomplishes a breakout from conformity, and that is the unremitting and irre irremediable clash with the loved one to which faith in God gives rise. So uh, insofar as the kind of neighbor love that Lugstrup thinks Kierkegaard is presenting in works of love uh, sets one at odds with the neighbor in a way, that's where um, you're, you're pushed out of the crowd and isolated in that sense. Um, so Lugstrup thinks Kierkegaard adopts his radical position in large part to avoid this conformism and life in the crowd. In these respects, the individual is isolated from others. They don't just do what other people want them to do or expect them to do. Um, you take responsibility for your relation to others in a certain way. Um, the decision how to act becomes theirs and the kind of guilt attached to failure here is not a kind of comparative guilt but is a sort of total guilt and the kind of agency involved has the sort of authenticity to it that um, you don't get with life in the crowd. So these are features or uh, aspects of Kierkegaard's view of what it is like to if you like escape life in the crowd that as we'll see, Lugstrup himself is going to try and capture, but in his own way. So Lugstrup thinks Kierkegaard's position on this 
doesn't really deliver the right kind of solution because, as I said, it goes too far, he thinks. So you abandon ethics for religion, but that makes the demand unintelligible in human terms. Uh, you make the demand unworldly in a certain sense because you disconnect it from the worldly good. It becomes nihilistic because you deprive the world of value. Uh, the, the, the life in the world really isn't important. It's the relation to God that matters. Uh, you lose the relation to the individual by treating God as a kind of middle term in your relationships to others. And the guilt involved becomes a kind of hyperbolic or infinite or total guilt um, insofar as you're constantly falling short of, uh, of a proper relationship to God. Now, um, uh, Lukestrup thinks that that's uh, 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 going too far, and he also thinks that um, it actually misrepresents the proper religious position that Kierkegaard claims to be representing. And in fact, uh, Lukestrup thinks Jesus himself uh, is on Lukestrup's, not Kierkegaard's. Um, so this is a passage from The Ethical Demand, um, in the so-called polemical epilogue um, about, which is mainly discussing Kierkegaard, uh, looks at the head, Kierkegaard thus determines love of the neighbor as synonymous with helping the neighbor to love God. Whereas a love which consists in filling the other human beings temporal wishes has nothing whatsoever to do with love. With this determination, Kierkegaard is already at odds with the proclamation of Jesus. Such a limitation of what love of the neighbor consists in is not to be found there. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the man who fell among thieves and lay in the road, robbed and injured, wanted to have his wounds bound up and to be brought to an inn and cared for. And the Good Samaritan helped the victim of the attack in exactly the way that the traveler for his part would wish to be helped. Which also means that in the proclamation of Jesus, there is a love for the neighbor, the content of which does not consist in helping the neighbor to love God, but consists in helping the neighbor in a temporal way. So here, Lukestrup's trying to argue, look, Kierkegaard goes too far, even, as it were, <laughs> uh, by comparison to what Jesus himself says. So Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan is all about helping the uh, injured traveler in, if you like, worldly ways, uh, caring for them, you know, helping them uh, get care, uh, as assistance for their injuries, et cetera, et cetera. It's not all about putting the neighbor in the right relation to God. So uh, Lukestrup thinks Jesus is on his side, not Kierkegaard's side, uh, which I guess is you know, a good strategy in, in this context. Now, as I've said, what I've done is to present in fairly briefly Lukestrup's own way of characterizing Kierkegaard's position and the criticisms he therefore gives of it. Now, as I said, it's then a matter of uh, dispute and debate whether uh, whether Lugstrup's right, whether this is a fair way to read Kierkegaard. And you know, those of you who are Kierkegaardians in the audience are no doubt already sort of annoyed with everything I've been saying. Uh, I just want to try and put that to one side for the purposes of the rest of this talk, right? Uh, I think it's an interesting question. I'm happy to discuss it, but I don't want to get bogged down in that issue, whether is Lugstrup's reading of Kierkegaard a fair one. I wanted to instead consider a different question. Assume, for the sake of the discussion, that a position of the sort that Lugstrup attributes to Kierkegaard is too extreme and hyperbolic, right? So crudely, you know, this transition from ethics to some kind of religiously grounded position of a radical kind, is that, whether or not that's Kierkegaard's view, uh, is that a solution to the issue of life in the crowd? Or is it too extreme and hyperbolic? And if it is too extreme and hyperbolic, what's the alternative? How can Lugstrup occupy this sort of middle position between this more hyperbolic view and life in the crowd? All right. Again, leaving aside whether he's right to say <laughs> Kierkegaard has this extreme view himself. Okay, so that's what I want to discuss in what follows. How else can Lugstrup show how ethics is able to avoid life in the crowd. Um, now, broadly speaking, Lugstrup's response 
to this issue is to argue that the options are not just disjunctive. It's not a choice between life and the crowd or this more extreme Kierkegaardian view for, uh, as he understands it. So in um, controversial Kierkegaard, he says, uh, for Kierkegaard, the universal disjunction is either to live in relation to the infinite idea or to live a life of conformism. The requirement is enjoined upon us. I, uh, uh, the requirements in, enjoined upon us are either those of eternity or those of conformity, but this disjunction is spurious. So, as I said, Lugstrip's arguing from middle third way between these two extremes. And that's, I think, what the ethical demand is um, designed to represent. Now, what is the ethical demand in Lugstrip? Let me just briefly say something about that, because that's, as I say, what is meant to occupy this middle um, position. Um, Lugstrip argues that the ethical demand has certain key features, um, and that the most sort of prominent are that it's silent, that it's radical, that it's one-sided, and that it's unfulfillable. And because of that, he argues it differs from ordinary social norms in ways that means it can incorporate the features that Kierkegaard identified with his infinite demand, but without the drawbacks. So let me first explain what that means and then see whether Lugstrup's right that he solves the problem. Um, so what does he mean by the ethical demand? Well, briefly put, um, Lugstrup thinks the demand arises because we are dependent or vulnerable creatures. We're dependent on each other in various fundamental ways. And as a result, we have power over other people um, because they are dependent on us in certain key respects. And then the ethical demand just says, uh, and, and this is his summary of what it is, uh, he says the radical demand says that the other's life should be cared for in a way that best serves the other. That's what we should do with the power that we have over others is to care for them in a way that best serves them. I'll say a bit more about that later on, but that's the you know key idea. And then it follows from that, Lugstrup thinks that the demand has certain fundamental features that I've mentioned. So first of all, it's unspoken or silent, which means basically, I think, two things. First of all, you can't just do what the other person asks you to do. Um, so it's not given content by just what they asked of you. Um, and you can't just follow prevailing social norms. And I'll be saying more about that. Right. Um, so, you know, a simple example, if, if uh, you know, somebody in the street needs your help, uh, but is demanding that you give them drugs or something, uh, you know, um, so recreational drugs, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it may or may not be the best way of caring for them to give them what they are asking for. And as we'll see in more detail later, you may or you may not be able to just follow prevailing social norms in deciding how to act. Secondly, it's radical, and he means sort of various things under that heading, but I think the ones that, you know, mainly we can focus on are that you take responsibility for your action in a certain way, and that means it's isolating what you do, and I'll say more about that in a bit. You also have to act unselfishly uh, in order to fulfill the demand to really understand um, what it is that the other needs. And the other person has no right to make the demand. Thirdly, the demand is one-sided in the sense it's not reciprocal in the sense that you can demand something in return for whatever help that you give to the other. Um, so it's an idea of non-reciprocity non or non-payback, as, as Lutzstrup sometimes puts it. You can't demand anything back in return for what you've done as, as payback. And uh, fourthly, it's unfulfillable, um, where I think the idea here is that uh, if you feel it as a demand, you've already failed. Um, uh, because the idea is that you should be responding in love rather than as a demand. But as we'll see, that doesn't, by unfulfillable, he doesn't mean that it's limitless. Now, there's much more we could say about all that, but hopefully that's enough to just give us what we need for the rest of the discussion. And 
a, a, a further key point here is that Lugstrup contrasts the ethical demand to what he calls social norms. Um, now, we need social norms, Lugstrup thinks, for two main reasons. First of all, to simplify our social interactions, to give them a kind of structure. And secondly, to protect us from one another, as we are not always motivated to act on the ethical demand. So when we're talking here about social norms, you might be an easy way to think about it is thinking, for example, of certain laws or, um, uh, governing, say, how parents should relate to their children. Right. There are certain things that parents are required to do by the state um, in order to um, look after their children. Right. Now, again, it doesn't have to be laws. Uh, the, the, the norms could be enforced more um, informally than that through other kinds of social sanctions. But that's one example of a kind of social norm. Now, why is that helpful? Well, first of all, again, it, it gives us sort of structure to parent-child relationships that in some sense can make it easier, but also it can protect us um, because we don't always, we, um, we, we don't always genuinely care for other people. Um, and so we need a sort of backup structure to ensure that we behave decently towards others, um, even when care fails. And the way that that can work is that these social norms, um, by having other kinds of uh, incentives, other kinds of forms of enforcement, can give you other motives to act. So, you know, I may not love my kids <laughs> for whatever reason, um, but nonetheless, I'll still, you know, behave uh, decently towards them because I'm afraid of being arrested and, and thrown in jail by the social services. Of course, that doesn't make me a great parent, but it does protect my kids, right? Um, and that is important because, you know, not all parents love their kids, right? So you need a sort of backup structure. That's, that's why social norms um, are important um, in, 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 in the social structure. So to just give you a very simple example to sort of illustrate the, the difference, I mean, think about, you know, again, now a student case, so I suppose a student comes to you, um, in, first of all, wanting an extension for their essay for whatever reason, well, there are all sorts of norms, you know, set up by your institution for governing how and when you give essay extensions, and you can just consult those norms and act accordingly. Right. And why you do, do it, you, you could do it because you really care about the student and you think the extension will give them a really good chance of writing a better essay, et cetera, et cetera. That could be your reason. That's fine. But it could also be, look, you know, you're just following the rules. You know, you'll get the sack if you don't apply the rules correctly and you give them an extension. In a way, from a certain perspective, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, you've done the right action, maybe for, as it were, less than. Uh, exalted moral reasons, but fine, the, the students got their extension. But there are other cases where that's not going to work, right? So if the student has come to you with serious personal problems, there aren't a set of rules, a set of norms that you can just follow, and your motivation does have to be a sort of more genuine one, closer to the ethical demand, right? Close, closer to concern with their well-being and so on. So given this structure, social norms can constitute a kind of conformism or life in the crowd, right? I, I'm just, if I'm doing, giving the essay extension, I'm just going along with whatever the norms are. But the ethical demand isn't like that, right? If I'm dealing with the problems of this student, I am, now this is again, this is picking up on these Kierkegaardian features of life outside the crowd. I am isolated from others, right? In the sense that I can't just say, well, I was following the rules. You know, if something goes wrong with this student to whom I've given, you know, my sincere advice, uh, I can't just point to the rules and say, well, you know, it's not my fault. The rules are obviously um, inappropriate, right? Um, but but I'm isolated in a sense, but I'm still ethically related to them. So it's 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 still within the domain of ethics. Secondly, I have to take responsibility. Again, I can't just um, point to the rules as being um, what's gone on here. Um, I have to have to accept that this is the advice I gave is something that I took on. And if it goes wrong, I, I have to accept 
some personal responsibility for what goes wrong. So the decision is in some sense your own, in that sense, it is a kind of decision. And it's not just comparative guilt in the sense, I'm not just guilty, oh, because I didn't follow a certain set of rules. But again, it's not hyperbolic guilt either. Um, so again, it has a kind of radicality to it. It takes you beyond the social norms, but not over to the more extreme hyperbolic guilt. And again, you can say more generally that there's a sort of, if you like, authenticity in my action here that is more genuine than if I'm just sitting in my office doling out essay extensions by following the rules, right? So the idea then is that this is still ethical, but more radical than following a kind of life in the crowd represented by the social norms. Therefore, if you like solving Kierkegaard's problem and incorporating some features of Kierkegaard's solution, but within the context of ethics rather than beyond ethics. So the suggestion would be this solves the problem, right? Uh, we are going beyond the social norms, um, and but we are therefore incorporating ideas so that, that the individual is isolated and responsible and authentic and so on, but we're still within ethics. So problem solved. That's the thought. Um, uh, and I'm running a bit out of time, so I don't think I'm going to <laughs> read the quotes. Um, but yeah, it, it just sort of says what I've just said, hopefully. OK, but to finish up, I just wanted to um, get, run through some possible critical responses. As I say, not interpretative issues. Is, is Kier, looks for it right to interpret Kierkegaard as failing to answer this problem, et cetera, et cetera. But more thinking about Lugstrup's own position, does it work? Does it actually solve the problem, as I've suggested? And I'm just going to run through three uh, challenges, potentially, I think. So first of all, Lugstrup argued against Kierkegaard that his position, Kierkegaard's position, is empty of content. Why isn't the ethical demand the same? Secondly, how does the ethical norm really relate to the social norms uh, in the sort of structure I presented? And then thirdly, isn't the ethical demand also hyperbolic in, in certain respects? So I'll just try and say something about that quite quickly in the last five, 10 minutes. So uh, one feature of Lugstrup's challenge to Kierkegaard is that the infinite demand, Kierkegaard's infinite demand, uh, Lugstrup thinks lacks content because its method is formalistic. So roughly what he means here, I think, is that just as Kant tried to deduce the content of the moral law from its form as a law, so Kierkegaard tried to deduce the content of the demand from its form as a demand. But then Lugstrup thinks all we know about the demand is that love of the neighbor comes to consist in helping them to live their life as a demanded life, which for us must consist in self-denial. So we sort of know that we're doing the right thing if we're experiencing the ethical as making these self-denying demands of us. And that's, as it were, getting content from form, just as uh, Kant was trying to get content from form. Um, and um, Lugstrup thinks one problem with this is that we get the wrong content, as we've seen, we end up losing the content of care from love of the neighbor. But the other problem is that the content we get is, in the end, still empty. So just as you have a, a sort of empty formalism worry about Kant that um, probably you're probably familiar with, so Lugstrup presses a sort of empty formalism objection to, Lux, uh, to, to Kierkegaard. Uh, so he says, a further peculiar characteristic of works of love is that we are told nothing whatsoever regarding the absolutely decisive definition of love of the neighbor, namely that it consists in helping the neighbor and the loved one to love God. So in an interesting way, again, leaving aside interpretive debates, I think uh, Lugstrup raises an, a version of the empty formalism objection against Kierkegaard that we're probably familiar with um, from uh, discussions of Kant. Now, again, as before, leave aside whether Lugstrup's critique of Kierkegaard is fair. What about an, a deeper worry, perhaps, which is, well, doesn't Lugstrup's position suffer from the same problem? Isn't his ethical demand also empty? 
because after all, it doesn't seem to say very much, right? All it says is the radical demand says that the other's life should be cared for in a way that best serves the other. Right? Well, you might think, okay, great. Uh, but, you know, what does that mean? What do I actually do, right? What, what, what does care mean here? What, what should I be thinking about and so on? Don't we need more content um, to make sense of this? And if we respond to the challenge by adopting a more particularist approach, then you might think, well, actually, we don't need the radical demand at all because it's it's a general principle and we've gone completely particularist. And so, you know, just forget it altogether. Right. So, again, why doesn't Lugstrup's solution suffer from the same problems as what he presses against uh, Kierkegaard? Well, uh, the thought here is, well, no, Lugstrup gets the balance exactly right. OK. Um, so he's not an extreme particularist, right? Because he does offer the ethical demand as a kind of principle. Uh, we've just seen what it is. But it's not, I think, empty or abstract either, because um, care itself, or the notion of care itself, as Lugstrup says, requires understanding, insight, and imagination on the part of the ethical agent. And it requires a kind of focus on the person in need in the way that other principle-based ethics arguably doesn't. So Kantian universalizability in a way takes you further away from the person who you're confronted with needing help, right? Because you start wondering about whether your maxims can be universalized. Well, you know, that is not to engage with the person who needs help. And similarly, if you're engaged in utilitarian maximization, you're not focused on the individual, you're focused on, well, you know, if I do that, what will the broader implications be um, in terms of maximizing the good, etc. Um, and, and, and so there is a kind of content um, generated by this principle, because it, as it were, forces you to pay attention to the person who is in need. But of course, um, uh, uh, you're not told exactly what to do about that content, uh, but the content is, is given by the way in which you're relating to a dependent being instead of trying to derive content from form. Now, of course, that won't satisfy you if you want a sort of decision procedure for every ethical problem that comes your way, but Lugstrup isn't in the business of doing that either. That, as he puts it in the ethical demand, is trying to master existence by way of theory, and it's a kind of false hope. But it's not contentless either, I think, because the way to develop that content uh, is to care, to attend, to use expressions from they and Murdoch, to attend to the other. Um, but again, that very attention requires you to get beyond life in the crowd. So I think Lugstrup gets the balance exactly right, um, rather than succumbing to a kind of empty formalism objection. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, well, OK, we've set up this picture now where we've got um, the ethical demand um, and we've got like, uh, the social norms, but um, uh, um, Lugstrup's worry against, uh, another worry against Kierkegaard was the position is too dualistic, right? Because for Kierkegaard, you have, on Lugstrup's reading, you have the ethical on the one side and you have the religious infinite demand on the other, and they're seen as at odds with one another. But couldn't someone say, well, isn't Lugstrup's position also dualistic because you've got a clash between the social norms and the ethical demand? Um, and isn't in a way this even more problematic than Kierkegaard's position because it's within we're within the same sphere or stage to put it in Kierkegaardian terms. Well, again, I think that Lugstrup can respond to this worry because, in fact, it's a little bit more sophisticated than I suggested in presenting it because he does talk about the the, the social norms and the ethical demand. Um, having some relation to one another. And he often puts this in terms of refraction. So, you know, if you think of your, you know, Pink Floyd album cover, uh, refraction, you get sort of white light coming in one end and colored light coming out the other. Uh, you could think of the, 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 the ethical demand as being the white light coming in 
And then that gets refracted into various kinds of social structures. So in a, a later kind of collection of uh, sort of essays, Ethical Concepts and Problems, um, Lugstrup says about this, the ethical demand is refracted as through the prisms of all the different and particular relationships in which we stand to one another, as spouses, parents and children, teachers and students, employers and workers, as they are all forms of the fundamental condition whereby the ethical demand gets its content. So the idea, I think, basically is that you couldn't really make the social norms work if they had if they had no relation to the ethical demand, if, if you were the kind of parent who literally just followed the law, <laughs> you couldn't really function properly as a parent, right? You can't operate the, the social norms entirely on their own because the ethical demand is, the, is embodied in some, to some extent within the social norms, right? And if you lost track of that altogether, you're not gonna be a good parent or a good, uh, ac uh, academic or whatever, right? But on the other hand, you can't make the ethical demand just work on its own for the reasons we discussed previously. So there is an, an interconnection, a kind of complementarity, as, some, uh, as Hans Sphinx has put it, between these two. It isn't a kind of dualism. Uh, and again, I've got a quote from Murdoch saying similar things, but I, 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 I'm sort of running out of time. So just finally and quickly, the third problem, um, doesn't um, Lugstrup's position end up as itself kind of hyperbolic? Um, isn't the ethical demand itself over demanding? Uh, and if so, um, uh, but, but if it's gonna avoid that, how can it do so without collapsing back into the mediocrity of life in the crowd? Now, Again, this is an interesting issue, and Lugstrup's position can certainly sound demanding. So there, there are passages where Lugstrup, um, you know, does make it clear that uh, the ethical demand will ask more of us than perhaps we feel comfortable giving, as it were. So he says, for example, furthermore, the radicality of the demand consists in not only taking care of the life of the other when the trust they show me lifts my own courage in life, but also when it is most unpleasant for me because it interferes disturbingly with my existence. So Lugstrup certainly is prepared to characterize the ethical demand in quite demanding ways. Um, but on the other hand, he's quite careful to say that it's not limitless. Um, so uh, in another passage, he says, as has been said, it's radicality means that demand can only be fulfilled through selflessness. However, this does not mean that the individual has limitless responsibility for everything under the sun regarding things which are none of their concern. If indeed there is no limit to the individual's responsibility, then we have ended up in a situation which is ethically meaningless. And uh, he makes three points uh, to, uh, to provide a kind of check to this limitlessness. First of all, that we should be careful not to exaggerate our responsibilities to give content to our own lives, a sort of uh, ethical do-goodery, as it were, that, that, that might fill the emptiness of your own existence. He also thinks we have to take care that um, we don't treat ethics as so demanding that it leads to paternalistic encroachment on the lives of others. For example, overzealous parents in relation to their children, and thirdly, we should be careful not to confuse political responsibility, where we arguably have responsibility as we're at a political level, with ethical responsibility, where we have less because we have less actual um, power. And it's that notion of power that I think ultimately uh, might provide a solution here. And I've discussed that in a, in a separate uh, essay, which I'm happy to talk about. But again, I'm running out of time, but roughly speaking, the idea here is that um, the ethical demand is, isn't a demand to just you know, make everyone's life happy. Um, it's a demand to use the power that their vulnerability gives you for your good, uh, for, for their good and not yours, because otherwise you're exploiting this power. And that's, I think, what that passage there is saying. And in the, the article I've just mentioned, I try to suggest that that then 
limits uh, to some extent the kind of uh, it, the way in which the demand operates that prevents it from becoming hyperbolic. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of it going over time, so I won't try and go through the details of that, but I'm happy to discuss it if anyone's interested. So uh, the conclusion then is that um, whether or not Lugstrup's right to criticize Kierkegaard himself in the way he does, uh, Lugstrup manages to come up with a solution to the problem that Kierkegaard raises of life in the crowd that remains, um, that, 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 that enables him to um, distinguish between life and the crowd and the ethical demand, but in a way that doesn't become problematic in the way that he thinks Kierkegaard's view does. So that's why I'm suggesting in a sort of positive spirit that um, Lugstrup's able to find this attractive, I think, middle position between life and the crowd on the one hand, and um, some kind of more extreme Kierkegaardianism on the other. Good, I'll stop there. And again, apologies for going slightly over time. <laughs> Fantastic, great talk. There's gonna be a lot to discuss, I know. Um, so just a logistical point, um, the way that mm -hmm. seminar discussions will proceed for this session and then future sessions as well, is we'll open uh, the discussion first for anybody who's at Wolf or GCAS, and then we'll have uh, comments and questions from anybody else. So I'm new to GCAS, so if I don't recognize your name, I apologize. But looking through the list of attendees, I recognize James, you're, you're at GCAS. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there's anything that you uh, want to say to Bob, questions or comment, uh, feel free to do so, and then we can uh, move on to additional questions after that. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. No, I don't have any questions. And thanks, Bob, for, for giving this presentation. It's been very informative. I mean, for me, looking at the ethical question um, and, and then through our, our history, right, and how we define ethics. For me, I, I sort of wrote a question down about who writes the ethical demand in the relation to social normal balance, right? I mean, if, if we are writing our history and writing our own perceptions of ethics, how do we actually determine what is true and what is not true and what is right, what's not right? And I think it's really just a balance, you know, that there could be no utopic in a sense world of, or society. It's about trying to find the balance of say the ethical demand um, versus the life in the crowd, right? Um, so, but yeah, very interesting talk. And I had some really good notes and I thank you for that. Great, and actually that's a very good question. I can say a couple of things about it if, if you're interested. So um, I think the way that Lugstrup understands this is um, he thinks the ethical demand in some sense is absolute. So he is, in, in my reading at least, he's a kind of natural law theorist at one level. Um, so he thinks uh, that you know, it is just absolutely the case that you should not exploit the vulnerability of other people. However, where he's then, if you like, more relativistic is at the level of the social norms, because how we can exploit others, you know, varies enormously depending on different cultures, if you like, and different circumstances. Um, so, you know, just to take a very trivial example, I mean, now with the internet, <laughs> I can kind of do things to you that I couldn't do before, right? Um, I, can, I can make your life a misery in ways that wasn't possible before, right? So of course, now we've, in, we've evolved all sorts of social norms that govern how we behave on the internet in order to protect ourselves from that vulnerability. Now that wouldn't have made sense. You know, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when there was no internet and it would have been, you know, you could have said to me as a child, don't do all these things. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, it would have made no sense, right? Now we've got all sorts of social norms governing the internet, you know, both at the legal level, but also more, you know, broadly at a sort of social cultural level, things that are disapproved of, you know, and all the rest of it. Now, then you might think, well, how does that connect? And then, of course, the connection is, well, in one way or another, they're trying to protect us from each other's power. But uh, 
what that power involves will vary from, as I say, context to context. And as you say, that's a process of constant negotiation and working out. And, you know, we do it well and we do it badly and we try certain norms and we try other norms and so on and so forth. And, and you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So there's a sort of side to, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to put it quite in these terms because looks it wasn't really a, a fan, but there is a sort of Marxist and almost materialist side to, to, to Lugstrup in a way, which says, well, you know, actually, yeah, what, because ex, our vulnerability to others is informed by our, if you want to put it in more marks, our material conditions, and because those conditions can change, then these social norms are constantly sort of evolving and changing and so on. And, and it's a sort of constant process and it can be done well, it can be done badly, et cetera. So I think maybe that fits with the spirit of your question, right? Um, but underlying it, I think, is this this constant uh, absolute, um, which um, again I think is an interesting combination of views. I, I find it quite attractive, but uh, <laughs> you know, others may not. Uh, thanks, James. If you have something you want to say, follow up. That's fine. Otherwise, um, yep. No, I'll, I'll leave it to everyone else. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thanks. Great. Well, if anybody else has a comment question, feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in. Thank you, Bob. I'll just, uh, I'll just pose one question. Uh, and, and it has to do with the final point um, of your sort of objections and trying to, to defend Lurkstrup against these worries, the hyperbolic um, worry, because in a way, I would say that he is hyperbolic. Uh, mm -hmm. Not in the limitless sense, but if you just look at, sorry, we, we've got a, a, ch a child sort of making noises in the background. Nobody's getting strangled, uh, just, <laughs> just to make, make that clear. Um, so it, just in a single sense, if you, what he says is basically that you should love the, the neighbor, right? That is the, the ethical demand that whoever you're dealing with, uh, not, notwithstanding uh, whether they've done anything bad or good to you, you should genuinely care uh, for them so that you can... Uh, yeah. do what is best what what serves their life best so uh, in a way i could say well that isn't fair i mean if, if somebody uh killed my wife or <laughs> hurt my child or whatever and and they are sort of unfortunately for them they got injured uh doing that as well so they are lying there bleeding on the on the ground i should genuinely care for them uh, in that instance that seems pretty hyperbolic uh, to me right um, so so yeah what 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 do you say to that yeah good i mean I, I suppose again it's a question of striking a balance right so what i'm trying to say is that you know in to some extent an important extent looks it's pretty sympathetic to kierkegaard right and just as you know kierkegaard emphasizes offense and 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 so on that the, the um you know well, again, a sort of Christian ethics, if you like, can can ask you to do all sorts of things that, you know, shock the non-Christian and, and shock the pagan and all the rest of it. I think Lugstrup's trying to incorporate some of that, right? Um, where he thinks it becomes hyperbolic in a in a in a problematic way is when it becomes almost empty. So um, you know, one one issue he often focuses on, as, as you know full well, is you know guilty about feeling guilty, that kind of stuff, where it just becomes it just becomes a wheel spinning. You know, uh, why am I guilty? Well, you know, because I'm not feeling guilty enough about feeling guilty, and then that becomes ethically empty in a way. I mean, there's nothing you can do, right? Once you're in that sort of zone, <laughs> uh, it loses all relation to action. It loses all, therefore, all relation to ethics. And that's the kind of hyperbolic problem that I think he's trying to solve. Now, your hyperbolic problem is a perfectly reasonable, much more, you know, perfectly sensible. Well, yeah, I'm being asked to do all this stuff and it just seems too much, right? I mean, um, but I think that, there looks strips more on Kierkegaard's side. You know, what do you expect, right? Ethics is tough. We're rotten creatures, you know, get over yourself, right? Uh, you're going to have to, you're going to have to be asked, you know, 
I mean, love the enemy, of course. I mean, you know, Bjorn and I have discussed this before, but love thy enemy, of course, is shocking and was, again, I mean, depends how you read all this stuff, but it was, you know, intentionally shocking in a certain sense to Greek ethics, et cetera, et cetera, right? So to that extent, again, Lukestrup is on Kierkegaard's side, right? The danger is that Lukestrup went too far and ended up with this bad form of hyperbolic, you know, as Lukestrup understands it. Now, as far as you're concerned, as it were, fine, you know, I think, um, you know, you, you can have your, your worries, but that's again why Lukestrup is an interesting character in these debates, right? Because um, he, as I mentioned, as you, again, you know full well, he, he does want to go beyond, if like, ordinary, you know, if you like, commonsensical, you know, life in the crowd ethics, right? Uh, and of course, that wouldn't ex ask you to do to love the enemy or, or, you know, to 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 care for the other if they've you know done all these unspeakable things to you and so on. And that does, you know, to make sense of that does require moving beyond, if you like, the sort of metaphysics and, on, and, and anthropology of ordinary ethics. Right. So we're our all sinners, for example, is, I think, has to underpin some of this stuff. And of course, that's not a normal part of, you know, straightforward social norm like ethics. Um, so I think he would, as it were, bite the bullet, but say it's not hyperbolic in the way that he's, he himself is worried about. Um, mm. But I mean, that still may not satisfy you. It's still, you know, as he himself says, uh, you know, won't we perfectly reasonably protest, but hey, you know, what's in it for me? And why should I care for my enemy? And, you know, th this seems crazy, but I think he's prepared to bite the bullet there, whether or not you like it, but it's still, I think he can keep his distance from the sort of hyperbolicism, if that's a word, <laughs> of, of as he sees it in Kierkegaard. Does that help? I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree that that he sort of wants to avoid the, the emptiness and limitless uh, versions of hyperbolicism, system, if that is a word. But yes. but yeah, I, I think it would be wrong to say there isn't any anything hyperbolic in yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Anybody else? If not, if you're thinking, I, I have some questions and comments I could maybe put to Bob. I don't know how interesting they'll be. One, I think, is a, a somewhat minor point, but uh, sort of maybe like the halfway point or so of the, the presentation when you were outlining the nature of the ethical demand, mm. uh, you were sketching some of its features with regard to its radicality. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned in passing, I know this is something you developed in your book, but I can't recall the details. So I'm hoping you can refresh my memory. You said that uh, the person who's in need doesn't have a right mm. to issue the demand. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting feature of what uh, this account. Could you remind me then what is the source of the obligatoriness for the person <laughs> who's being who's being claimed by the caller or or what, what's going yeah. on with 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 the nature of obligation then? Yeah, great. Well, I mean, that's the 60 million dollar question, as it were, or whatever the, <laughs> the metaphor is. Um, but I think this is really important to the whole Luke Strip sort of story and why he's distinctive. Um, and different from more contemporary views, like you know, people like Stephen Darwell, who is <laughs> temporarily my colleague at Yale, and we've had discussions about this. But you know, a, a more standard way of seeing obligation in the contemporary debate it, it is, in effect, rights-based, right? So, as you probably know, you know, Darwell's second-person ethics stuff. Um, it, you have a you or the moral community of which you are part or some combination of the two have a kind of right uh, to demand that um, you, you care or whatever it is right um, and so obligation derives from um, this kind of rights-based structure now that's actually relevant I again I didn't have time to Bring it in, but I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, this is relevant to this whole distinction between the ethical demand and social norms. So, um, Lukestrup, I think, sees rights as embedded within social norm discourse, if you like. Um, so, for him, rights are broadly contractual in 
their logic and the contractual nature means that they're part of the sort of social context right so you know trivial example but you know you and I well Bjorn's got a young baby so you know Bjorn sets up a, a babysitting circle at some point um, and you know there are various rules governing the babysitting circle and Bjorn is allowed to ask you know other people in the circle to look after his child you know once a month and, and vice versa right and so there are clear rules we all know what we're doing that's very helpful you know again social norms can be great uh, it's, a, it's a really clear structure uh, which you can rely on it in various ways people are motivated to do it for various reasons you don't really care as long as they do it great all wonderful and you know rights talk makes sense because uh, in the in the in the context that you know if if uh, Bjorn's friend in the circle doesn't turn up or doesn't agree to their monthly responsibility to look after Bjorn's child he can say but hang on you know this is what we agreed you know I have a right to demand that you help my you look after my baby and that makes perfect sense we all know what we're doing it's all within social norms and that's where for looks at rights have their home right um now the ethical demand is an obligation that in some sense as we've been discussing you know goes beyond all that right and because it goes beyond social norms, rights doesn't have the kind of purchase, right? Because where you get those rights from, for Lugstrip, you get these rights because they've been agreed, right? Again, why does a student have a right to, you know, the uh, supervisions I give them? Well, because it's agreed, it's, it's, it's the contract. Right? That doesn't apply at the level of the ethical demand. So then there's a question, okay, where does the ethical demand get its obligatory force then, if not, on based on these rights claims. And I think Lokstrup's um, view is, well, it, it just doesn't get, <laughs> it does have obligation, obligatory force, but not on that basis. And the reason uh, is that in, in many ways, that's the wrong basis for responding to the other, because as Bjorn briefly mentioned, really we're not talking about obligation at all in the end, we're talking about love, right? And you can't demand a right to be loved. Right. that would be just weird <laughs> um that that just it doesn't make sense right uh, logically i demand you know that you love me um the thing just and and there are other phenomena like this like gratitude right so i might be obliged um uh, sorry not gra well gratitude yeah but forgiveness is a clear example i might be in some sense obliged to forgive you but you don't have a right to be forgiven so I think Lugstrup's interested in those phenomena where it actually makes perfect sense to say there are obligations without rights. Um, now, as I said, you might think it's unsatisfactory because it might think, well, rights provide an explanation for where the normative force comes from. But I think Lugstrup thinks, yeah, you're buying that explanation at too high a cost. It's not really applicable to the, to the cases we're interested in. It works fine for social norms, but it doesn't work for um, the, the ethical demand. So that I think it puts uh, Lugstrup interestingly at odds with the sort of contemporary scene. And I think he's right, uh, I have to say. I think, I think that um, you know, we've become bewitched by a sort of contractual model of ethics, which is, you know, is very attractive and, and quite appealing up to a point, but it doesn't we shouldn't make it the whole story because again if we do we are collapsing ethics back down to social norms all the time we're losing exactly the level that i think Lugstrup's correctly focused on the sort of distinction he's interested in and so you know again well don't tell steve darwell i i said this but i you know i will say this to him in person i'm not just but you know i think in the end that kind of ethics is it's a, the ethics of social norms not of, of the ethical demand so does that help at all uh yeah no that, that that's very helpful i mean i have a number of other things i could ask that are somewhat related but before i jump back in i want to give another chance to see whether anybody else who's following the discussion has something to say i don't know if maybe michael or tim does yeah there's a hand up oh. from alex let me see see how i Thanks, Bob. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, good. 
sorry. It's nice to see you. Sorry, I'm actually driving through rural Maine and lost connection for a minute. So hence the <laughs> lack of video. Um, but I wanted to sort of pick up on where the first question asked and also where you sort of ended with the last mm -hmm. and maybe invite you to say more about the isolating aspect of the ethical mm -hmm. demand in relation to the question of conformity. Um, and you might also think that uh, some of the absolute um, the absoluteness of the, the sort of natural law model that you were select, suggesting for Logstrup might, um, I'm sort of losing my, my train of thought here, but might not have some of that absoluteness, right? There might be contexts where that, that gets called into question or um, is not extended into those, con into those situations. So yeah, thanks yeah. again for your talk. No, good. And thanks for the question. Yeah, no, I, I think I see the worry. I mean, I think the way that I would understand it is, and perhaps one way of putting it is a kind of fallibilism, right? So what we know is that it's wrong to exploit another person and, and you know, that you should care, respond to them in the way that best serves their, their interests, right? That we know, that's absolute, let's say, right? But then the question is, um, well, in practice, you know, in a in a real concrete situation, what does that amount to? You know, what 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 does care for the other really involve? And and again, I mean, as you know, Lugstrup is a sort of enemy of trolley problemology and all that kind of stuff in ethics, right? So we're not, you know, don't think about these sort of thought experimenty, completely implausible, you know, very thin situations that ethicists are keen on but you know imagine yourself in a genuine case you know where where some friend has come to you with a real issue um and and uh or you know some friend is depending on you in a, a really significant way you know but a genuine case not a sort of trumped up philosopher's case now you know okay so you're to care for the other but what does that mean well, you know, that is a difficult question, right? There's all sorts of issues and complexities and uh, facts about them and, and, and your relation to them and, you know, implications and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really rich situation. And, you know, looks at says, well, use, you know, understanding, insight and imagination. You, you, you know, don't, don't do can't, don't, you know, think, well, what is my maxim here? I mean, this is a bit of a caricature, but don't think, what is my maxim here? Can I universalize it? You know, that's, that's hopeless. But, you know, think about the person involved, et cetera, et cetera, and the richness of the situation. Now, that, at that point, um, you know, you may well come to a view, right? And, you know, hopefully you will. You'll find a way forward. You'll think, okay, this is what I'm, you know, this is how I should respond here. This is the way to deal with this. And, you know, you've done that conscientiously, you've done it thoughtfully, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the, nonetheless, um, you know, you could, you could be wrong, right? That's the sort of fallibilism, because after all, these are complicated situations. There's no simple algorithm. And so the way that you've decided to move forward you know, may be mistaken, may turn out to be mistaken. You've done it in perfectly good faith, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you, you know, it turns out you gave the worst possible advice, let's say. You know, that happens, right? Now, the question is, what happens at that point? Do you say, well, look, hey, you know, I did my best, right? I, I, I tried. What can I do? You know, that's life. Well, I think if the looks at that wouldn't, you know, that's not the right response when we're thinking about the ethical demand. That isn't how you would respond, right? That might be how you respond at the level of the social norm. You know, I gave the student an extension to their essay. I followed the rule. Turned out it was a disaster. You know, they, they then became hyper perfectionists. They never wrote an essay ever again and they failed their course. You know, what do I do? You know, what can I do? I, I followed the rules. I'm in the clear. That seems, you know, okay in a way. I mean, that, that happens, right? In the ethical demand case, that would be a, not the right response, right? Um, so that's the sense in which you're isolated in a sense, you're, you bear a kind of personal responsibility, right? So it's isolated in that sense. But also you're isolated in the sense you can't, you know, appeal to certain well-established rules or you can't appeal to some expert, you know, some friend who said, well, I'm in this situation, it's all a bit complicated. What do you think I should do, 
right? Your guru or your priest or your friend who's a wise expert. You know, you can't do any of that either. So you are isolated in, I think, a sort of Kierkegaardian sense, right? You have to take a certain responsibility. There's a kind of authenticity in what you're doing here. Um, but that doesn't make it, again, relativist, right? Because what you're trying to do is care for the other. I mean, that's still absolutely the goal. And it's not that that goal is in some sense, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to achieve, but it's not, you know, in some hyperbolic, again, hyperbolic sense, completely, you know, opaque. <laughs> I mean, you could get it right <laughs> and it could be absolutely the right thing to do. But you still have to take on a sort of sense of ownership, if you like, or responsibility for what happens in the way that just wouldn't apply at the level of social norms. And so that's the sense in which, again, I think Lustrup's capturing something of what Kierkegaard is interested in, in relation to the distinction, but without, again, hopefully going too far, as it were, the other way, where, again, and again, again I don't think this fallibilism is the same as scepticism, right? It's, that would, again, be hyperbolic. If you said, well, actually, who knows? We never know the good for others. It's completely opaque to us, and I'm just not going to say anything. That would be, again, hyperbolic. So that's why I think he gets the sweet spot uh, right it seems to me. Does that make sense? Does that answer your your thought? Yeah, no, that certainly, that does make a lot of sense. And that does speak um, to the issue I, and, and gives me more to, to think about certainly. So thanks, Bob. I think Michael has a question too yeah. now. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, thank you so much for your talk, Bob. Uh, I have a, several different questions. I really appreciated that you were engaging the issue of the relation to social norms. Mm. Um, because I think that is really in many ways the connecting point to where you actually get some cash out of like how you engage with other people. Yeah. I have a question that's a little bit to the side of your issue about uh, life in the crowd. And it's about the encroachment um, provision that mm. Lucer builds in to the ethical demand that it can't endorse encroachment. Yes. Um, and I guess one of the worries I've been sitting with with this issue is, is he really entitled to build the, the restriction against encroachment into the, the absolute ethical demand? Hmm. Or is this just like a kind of uh, explanation of a social norm in like, you know, yeah. modern enlightenment society? So I want it to be part of the ethical demand, but is that just because I'm a modern enlightenment person? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I get that. That's a good, very good question. I mean, I think one way of coming at an answer might be, to, again, focus on this issue of power, right? So I think it's really important that I didn't, I skipped it because of time constraints, but there is a quote uh, where, you know, I think looks it makes it really clear that it's, it's power that's the issue. So your vulnerability, you know, take a simple example. You, you don't know the way to the station. You ask me the way. Um, okay, that gives me power over you. It's very trivial, you know, not a, not a huge deal, but you know, something, right? Now the question, the, the demand then is, well, what do I do with that power? Do I use it for my own good? I, oh, this guy doesn't know the way to the station. Great, you know, I can send him around the block five times. He's so desperate, he'll pay me a fortune to get that, you know, whatever, right? Uh, can't do that. I have to use this power for your good. Well. Let's assume that, you know, it's best you get to the station. I tell you the right way, you know, off we go. Okay. Now, um, I think the encroachment issue is where you think you've got more power, as it were, than you've been granted, or you're claiming more power than you've been granted, right? That's the danger of encroachment. So what all this doesn't give me is power over your will. I mean, that's how often Lugstra puts it, right? So... I'm given some power over your, your well-being, if you like, to, to, to make your life go well or badly. But this little setup doesn't give me power over your will. Right? And it, in a sense, I think maybe he thinks it can't. Now, maybe you think that's too much buying into some just enlightenment assumption, but I think maybe it isn't. I mean, I think maybe it's a sort of metaphysical claim you could make that you know, the kind of power transaction, if you want to put it that way, going on here doesn't involve giving me your will, right? Um, and it's only that in the end that generates 
real worries about encroachment because then I think, well, I have power over your will and therefore I can, you know, control your life in various directions. So I, I get your worry, but I think that would be how one way, at least, you could try and draw a more sort of constitutive link than it's just assumed because, you know, he wants to be a good liberal or something. Um, I don't know if that's convincing, but Bjorn has a comment on this as well. But I'd, yeah, be interested to hear what you think. No, I, I actually agree with what you say, Bob. It's just, it, it's, it struck me, Michael, and great to see you again, uh, by the way. Uh, it struck me that in the ethical concepts and problems, he actually, in, I think it's in the, the chapter on whether the Ten Commandments still apply. He actually says that it seems to him that, that the Ten Commandments don't necessarily apply today. Uh, if we were to rewrite them today, they would probably need a commandment on individual freedom because that has become a big issue. <laughs> so that sort of, that, that ties in well with what you said, that, that you know, maybe he, he, at least he is aware or he's conscious of uh, the role that individual freedom and authenticity and, and thus the will <laughs> um, uh, uh, plays in, in today's society. It's, it's not to say that he would just then say that it's, it's sort of on the social norms level. I don't think he would. I think he would probably say that we have now become much more aware of, of uh, um, sort of a, a, a natural law or natural claim that lies uh, that, that is there already. But, but it's, it, you could read that uh, passage at least and, and see if that makes any sense to you. And it also, sorry, just a, a trivial comment, but it just occurred to me, Bob, that we, we experienced this run around the block uh, uh, in a rickshaw in, uh, in Beijing, <laughs> right? <laughs> or more, more or less. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was it. <laughs> exactly and you handled it very well by <laughs> anyway that's another story does that help michael or if i could make a quick kind of response to that sure. i think part of the ambiguity here is the danger of encroachment actually presupposes you do have some power to uh, infringe on my will a little bit especially with children uh, he says but also with adults, like encroachment becomes a problem because it is possible for people to manipulate each other. Yeah. And but, so what I'm wondering here, yeah, and maybe you can respond to that in a, in a sec. What I'm wondering here is if it's really a question about the substantive good for the other, because the reason you can't encroach on the other is because it is never for their good hmm. for you to take control over the will, a power which you, is actually in your hands. And like what's in your, what you ought to do with that power is give it back to them or, you know, or, or help them expand their, their freedom. But maybe, yeah, you miss, don't agree with that characterization. I mean, I, I get, again, I get the worry, but I think that the point is not so much as a way the descriptive one, do we have power over people's will? I mean, in a sense, obviously we do. The question is where does the normative basis for the use of power come from? And for, for Lergstrup, it, it's justified. Um, because we're vulnerable, right? Vulnerability is what makes the use of power legitimate or illegitimate. And the point is, I mean, and that vulnerability is, you know, it, the ethical demands set up, right? Um, you, 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 you hand yourself over to me in some sense, right? It's not just that, you know, I can come and beat you over the head right sure you know, well I probably couldn't but you know assume I could uh, yeah I've got that power but that isn't an ethical demand generated power because it's not generated as, as as a result of your making yourself vulnerable to me in some sense right and so the normative grounding of the kind of power we're talking about can draw that distinction I think I mean that's what I try I would try and argue um um, uh, I, I, there's a passage, I can't remember where it's from, where it looks to, it has this sort of interesting distinction, which says, you know, we basically don't have to justify, I mean, it's a sort of Kantian thought, I suppose, we don't have to justify our power over objects or even animals, let's arguably, right? So I have power over this cup, and I can just do what I like with it, right? I don't have to justify that. Um, I do have to justify the use of power over you. Well, what justifies it? Well, because power is only legitimate if it's responding to vulnerability in a certain way. But if I'm just using my power to dominate your will, then I'm not responding to your vulnerability. I'm 
I'm just trying to dominate you. That's got nothing to do with the ethical demand, right? So power is only legitimately used um, within the sort of ethical demand situation. Now you could say, well, how, how does Lugstrup earn himself that claim? Well, then I think, yeah, maybe at the end of it all, he is relying on, you know, some enlightenment claim about how 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 we are in certain sense, you know, individuals with our own kind of lives and, and all the rest of it. Um, so, I mean, it's not that it's not playing a role, but I don't think it's just begging the question because I think he can draw some interesting distinctions that that justify, you know, handling these cases in different ways, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think we can leave it there because we're over, over time, but that's, I think the connection to responding to vulnerability is helpful thought. I'm not sure I buy it quite yet, but I have to keep Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much for your talk, Bob. No problem. Thanks a lot for the questions and comments. They're great. Good. Well, I'm glad that uh, the topic of the enlightenment has come up because maybe yeah. I, to concluding, the final question I have for you, Bob, it has something to do with uh, the nature of today's venue. You mentioned, well, why a talk on Lugstrup at a post-Kantian philosophy seminar? Mm. That's a question that arises sometimes, I think, with uh, Kierkegaard, right? So if you look at the Enlightenment and some of these Enlightenment figures like Kant and the kind of conception of systematicity and philosophical inquiry that was dominant during this uh, this this late 19th century period of time when, in which Kierkegaard's working, um, and this debate about the nature or the relationship between reason and revelation, some have thought, well, Kierkegaard isn't really actually a philosopher. Of course, Kierkegaard, in some sense, I think, took himself to be a philosopher of some kind, and of course, his hero Socrates, and mm -hmm. he thinks that he's undermining this uh, pretension of systematic philosophy to account for the human condition in a way that he just simply thinks uh, that kind of rational inquiry can't. So I'm wondering, though, what, what's the nature of uh, Lukstrop and his own self-conception right, as right. a sort of Lutheran uh, Christian? How, how does he sort of see his his uh, theoretical endeavor as a, as a philosophical exploit or philosophical inquiry. Do you have any kind of general comments about, about that, that question? Yeah, I mean, again, well, Bjorn might th th think I'm wrong here, but I suppose I do see it as a sort of middle way strategy. So, you know, again, on the one hand, I think looks it's pretty sympathetic to some of the worries that say Kierkegaard has about, you know, well, Hegel and systematicity and, you know, a sort of over rationalistic model of ethics, for example, that you might say you find in Kant and so on. So mm -hmm. it, to that extent, again, he's sort of sympathetic to Kierkegaard, I think. But on the other hand, I think, you know, again, despite all his religious commitments of various kinds, I think when he's doing this stuff, um, he's, he's not wanting to draw on, you know, religious assumptions, revelation, you know, any any of that kind of uh, end of sort of theology. Um, now, again, I think uh, he reads Kierkegaard himself as maybe going that way, uh, and that comes up in the controverting Kierkegaard in various respects. Um, again, rightly or wrongly, because as you say, there are different ways of reading Kierkegaard um, in relation to all this too. So I think what Lugstrup's doing is seeing the limits of a certain kind of version of Enlightenment ethics, if you like, a sort of hyper-rationalistic one um, and a hyper-universalistic one that is going to, you know, again, churn out, you know, I mean, yeah, think of Kant, I mean, you know, Kant's sort of weird optimism about ethics as if, well, you know, it's basically pretty easy, you know, you just apply the rules and off you go, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, it looks so it's much more aware of the difficulties of ethics, the problems of ethics, the, the challenges of ethics, the kinds of things we've been discussing, et cetera, et cetera. So he's much more sensitive to that. But again, he doesn't want to go the whole anti-enlightenment hog, I think, of, you know, resting it then on, say, you know, revelation or something and uh, and and going beyond reason and and faith and, you know, the sort of stuff that might I mean, again, fear and trembling is obviously a tricky text because it's not Kierkegaard, it's a pseudonym and so on. But the sort of thing that might drive one to, to this sort of position of fear and trembling, I think he's on Kant's side in a sense there, that that's going way off the end of the scale. So, you know, I think it is post-enlightenment in one way, but not 
as extreme as say a Kierkegaardian post-enlightenment might be. And I, again, I'm, I, as, as you can tell, I, I'm a sucker for this stuff. I think that's the right balance, right? That's what we want. Um, and I think it's stable. I, I, you know, the danger is of course it's unstable. Um, and that's partly that worry about, I had about, you know, contentlessness. Well, yeah, he, he gives you this sort of principle, but it's not really a principle. So is it empty? And therefore are we going to need, you know, to go beyond reason or something? And I don't think that's right. I think it, it, it works. Um, but, you know, does that, does that answer the, the worry? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's spot on. That's exactly what I was wondering. Yeah. So it is post-Kantian in the sense that it's going beyond Kant, but it's also sensitive to sort of Kantian worries about, you know, going too far beyond reason, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's why I'm glad that you agreed it was appropriate topic for <laughs> this seminar. Oh yeah, Tim. Yeah, we'll just quickly, I, I just want to apologize. I haven't actually asked any questions, but I found this hugely helpful. Thank you very much indeed. I've really enjoyed it. I'll yeah. carry on listening all day, to be honest. <laughs> great well thanks for your patience <laughs> no it's great not patience at all i really enjoyed it thank you great well uh thanks for everyone attending thanks for your questions your comments bob thanks to you above all for a really fantastic talk it's fascinating material it's yeah, really great. just been a delight for me to, to kick off this seminar with your work and so uh, i think unless anyone else has anything further to say we can we can conclude there for for today yeah. Great. Well, th thanks very much for the invitations. Excellent, really excellent comments and challenges and so on. So, yeah, and happy to continue the discussion. I'm sure we will uh, in different forms, but very nice to see you all as well. Great. And just one small correction in case people get confused. I'm only in Yale for this semester. Um, so oh. I'll, be, I'll be back in the UK after Christmas for you. But Wonderful. Anyway. And uh, yeah, this was recorded. It'll be posted. So if you know of others okay. that want to uh, check out the talk later, it'll be it'll be available. So great. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, again. thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Oh, yeah. My thank pleasure. You. All right. Everybody have a good day. Bye. Yeah, Bye.